Okay, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you're all staying safe and well and healthy. Thank you for attending our webinar today. My name is Jamin Chavda. I'm a partner with Chobi LLP in the Atlanta office. Uh, we are a full service law and accounting firm with six offices in the US, seven in India, and our Chug Global affiliates in several other countries. We provide outside general counsel services for businesses in the fields of corporate law, litigation, immigration, and tax and accounting services. So a quick update on the CARES Act and relevant topics. Um, the House and Senate agreed this week to extend the PPP program until August the 8th. Um, the, that's going to allow Congress some time to figure out what to do with the extra $134 billion that, billion dollars that they have pending and decide on further assistance for small businesses. The federal unemployment benefit will run out at the end of July and Congress is determining whether to extend that or not. And there's been talk of legal protection for businesses that reopen to protect them against COVID related lawsuits, but that is still in its early stages. We'll know more in the coming days and weeks. And so for today's topic, uh, since the start of the pandemic, there have been many businesses that are finding themselves in circumstances where they need to excuse or delay obligations to perform under existing contracts. So you may have heard the phrase force majeure being thrown around quite a bit in response to the upheaval caused by the coronavirus. But what does that mean for you and your contracts? So today we're going to discuss what force majeure is, how it's applied and enforced, risk assessments of contracts, how to break a contract, and other steps that businesses can take to protect themselves. A large part of what we do at the firm is draft, interpret, and then litigate contracts. And today we have a wonderful team that handles these matters on a regular basis, and they will be covering their portions of the webinar. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom there of your screen, and we'll answer your questions uh, during or immediately after the presentation. So to start the discussion, we've got Vikram Subramanian from our Santa Clara office. And uh, Vikram, if you could discuss the fundamentals of force majeure clause and uh, how to go about protecting businesses, please. Hi, Jamin. Yes, thank you for that kind introduction. I hope everyone out there is doing well today. Uh, so the topics I'll be covering are first and foremost, what are force majeure clauses? Uh, examples of situations where they may apply, and how you as a business can utilize these force majeure clauses to protect yourselves during the pandemic. Now, first and foremost, the force majeure clause is designed to free a party from a contract based on unforeseen circumstances beyond that party's control. So in this context, we would argue that COVID-19 and the pandemic that ensued as a result would qualify as an unforeseen event outside of the party's control that would allow the party to walk away from a contract, so to speak. Now, even if a party's contract does not mention COVID-19 by name, other similar words used in the force majeure clause should suffice. Uh, words such as pandemic, epidemic, catastrophe, disaster, act of God. Uh, this pandemic would, in our opinion, constitute a trigger of the force majeure clause. Now, the affected party would just really need to show that it's impossible to perform the terms of the contract and that non-performance and prove that non-performance was unforeseeable and outside of its control. So the legal terms people use, which some of you out there may not fully understand, but I just want to throw it out there, is called commercial impracticability and frustration of purpose. Now, what does that mean? Just what it is, frustration of purpose. So here are some examples that, you know, I want to throw out there. Uh, you know, ship carrying goods that goes underwater, uh, or gets kidnapped by pirates, uh, an earthquake destroying construction, uh, of course, war. I mean, and we definitely don't want anything like that. And likewise, COVID, you know, a force majeure may trigger in the instances of traveling to a resort, uh, a cruise ship where people are in close quarters with each other. And now I'd like to turn to the next slide where I'm going to actually show you some specific force majeure clauses. Now, it's a bit long, but just bear with me. I'll kind of go over with you the first 
uh, one, neither party will be liable for any failure or delay in performing an obligation under this agreement that is due to the, any of the following causes, such as acts of God, accidents, riots, war, or terrorist acts, epidemics, pandemics, quarantine, civil commotion, breakdown of communication facilities, and you see a whole host of other example, national strikes, explosions. Uh, the second clause, likewise, same kind of language we're talking about here, acts of God, riots, epidemics. Really what we're really looking for here is something unforeseen. I mean, we don't, we, we don't expect to walk out every day and expect an earthquake or an explosion and thank thank god it doesn't happen very often but you know that's why we put the clause in there just in case those instances do come up so that's pretty much from my side here i'd like to go back to jamin thank you all for your time today thanks vikram i'd be interested to see if any party has ever used the excuse of being hijacked by pirates and i certainly hope that doesn't happen to anyone on this call um, next, we've got uh, Dilavar Fazel from our New York office. He's going to discuss uh, the uh, anatomy of a force majeure clause. Thank you so much, Jamin. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Dilavar Ali Fazel, and I work with the corporate litigation team uh, in our New York and New Jersey office. Uh, my colleague, uh, Vikram, has already talked about the importance of force majeure clauses why they're needed and how to include them. I will be talking specifically about adding a force majeure clause in the contract and how to enforce these clauses in the code. Uh, so when I say adding a force majeure clause in a contract, what I mean is how to construct a force majeure clause when you are drafting a contract. Uh, and to understand this, uh, there is, uh, I will be explaining how force majeure clauses are constructed. A uh, force majeure clause contains three parts. One, a force majeure event. Second, the impact level. And third, the remedy. So what is a force majeure event? A force majeure event is an event which is beyond the reasonable control of a party and it is unforeseeable. Even if it is foreseeable, it should be unavoidable. So to explain it to you guys, I can give you an example of fire, right? Uh, there is a factory which produces explosives, right? And, and obviously, there is a good chance that a fire can erupt in that fire. However, if the factory is taking into account all the factors and trying to mitigate the risk of fire eruption, then obviously, in that scenario, it would be unavoidable if a fire erupts. So that would that can also constitute as a post major event. Uh, Whenever we are drafting force majeure clauses, it is really, really important for the parties to anticipate the kind of risk the agreement can have. Uh, and it is also very important to specify and identify those risks and events which can occur and put them in writing in the clause. So briefly to give you a little bit more understanding of these events, these force major events are divided into two broad categories. One is the natural force major event, and the other one is the political force major event. Natural force major events are the ones which are, which basically are natural hazards and which are outside the control of humans. Uh, they are typically, uh, these are the kind of events for which typically no person can be held liable. And these include like floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, any site, any kind of natural disaster. And a catch all phrase, which is commonly used in contracts for natural uh, force major events, is act, acts of God. Uh, while uh, Vikram was showing you the example of force major clause, we had act of God as a phrase put in both of those clauses. So act of God is a very broad phrase which covers a lot of those events which are beyond the control of human beings and are essentially natural disasters. Similarly, there are political force major events. These kind of events essentially deal with the risk related to the change in political and legal environment, such as like war, terrorism, 
civil disorder, labor strikes, disruptions, and curtailment of transportation. Uh, in addition to that, there are some other events as well, such as pandemics, epidemics, diseases, uh, which should also be included. And obviously, considering COVID-19, these are the kind of words which would definitely be put into the force majeure clauses. Now, uh, we need to understand just putting these events in there does not only does not necessarily is going to provide you a remedy under a force majeure clause. Uh, in order to get a remedy under a force majeure clause, it is very much dependent on the impact which it is causing to the affected party. And now, so for that reason, we will be moving to the impact level. So, uh, sorry, can you please go back to the second uh, the slide? Thank you. So the impact level, uh, there are four general impact levels, impossible, impracticable, material disruption, and commercially unfeasible. Uh, I would try to give you some real-time examples of all of these events so it is easier for everyone to understand. So for impossibility, we can take up an example of a concert which was scheduled to take place in April in New York in Madison Square Park. And there was an artist who was supposed to perform in that concert, but due to COVID-19, there was a government order of shelter in place and no such uh, huge gatherings were allowed. So it became legally impossible for those artists to perform. And it became impossible for to hold that concert. So there was an impact on a party. Similarly, in case of impracticable, uh, we can take an example of a grocery store. The supplier of that grocery store is in another city, let's suppose city A, and the grocery store itself is in city B. And the only way to get from city A to city B is through a bridge. And due to a massive flood, uh, it has, uh, the, the, the bridge has collapsed, and now it is impracticable for the supplier to supply the groceries to the grocery store. So in that situation, obviously the remedy would be either the once the transportation is available and once the bridge is back up, only then it can provide the supplies to the grocery store or there can be a total uh, exclusion from being uh, from doing the performance. Similarly, if we talk about material disruption, we can take an example of uh, a construction site and there was uh, an agreement between the two parties to construct uh, a building on one particular place and let's suppose there's an earthquake and due to an earthquake that land piece of land where the building was supposed to be constructed is now not suitable for construction so there is a material disruption in the in the agreement now and due to that material disruption the agreement cannot be carried forward so that can also be a kind of impact. Lastly, the commercial un commercially unfeasible. This is something really important. A lot of people would think, let's suppose, if uh, some uh, some some performance has become more uh, less profitable or it is more econ economically more uh, less advantageous, then the economically unfeasible impact level would come in. But that's not the case. Just on the basis of profitability and economically less feasible, this does not come in. The parties need to show that there is actually a discomfort and they have been harmed and they have been uh, they have been impacted in a way to avail this remedy. Uh, now, uh, again, as I said, uh, to avail a remedy, a party must establish a link between the event and the inability to perform and on the basis of the event and how the party's ability to perform has been impacted, a remedy is provided. Remedy can be in the shape of non-performance or partial performance or delayed performance. Uh, yes, so now I will be moving to enforcing how we enforce force major clauses and how courts interpret them. Uh, generally, U.S. courts interpret force majeure clauses narrowly, which means that they take specific events. They look up for specific events which are already mentioned in the force majeure clause. Uh, and 
and and this this is this is why we always say it is very important to anticipate, specify, and uh, specify these kind of events which the businesses or which the parties anticipate that can be of risk to in in the, in the force majeure clauses. Uh, and now I will be talking about the test, which is used by most of the courts in the United States to see whether a particular force majeure event classify as a, classify as a qualifying force majeure event or not. So the first and the foremost thing in it is whether the event is whether the event is a force majeure event. And in this, they will look at whether this is specified in the contract. If it is not specified in the contract, they will look for the language, the general language of the contract and see uh, where the was the event beyond the reasonable control of the parties, uh, reasonable control of the affected parties or not. And if it is beyond the reasonable control of the affected party, and although it is not listed in the list of the events, it would still be considered a force majeure event. But then the next layer which the court look at is the was the event foreseeable or and if it was foreseeable were there steps taken by the affected party to mitigate the risk or mitigate the event. If this again is a fact a question of fact for the court and it depends on case to case basis and this is what is determined by the court whether there were steps reasonable steps taken by the party or not to mitigate the risk or to mitigate the uh, happening of that event. Similarly and lastly, they look at the performance. How is the performance impacted? Has it become totally impos impossible for the party to perform the contract? Or is or whether the performance can be done, but at a later time? So that is how they l look up to it. And that is how the, co uh, the courts uh, interpret these clauses. Uh, lastly, I would also like to point out to the fact that at times in these clauses there is a mandatory notice provision and you should always look out for those provisions. If there is one, you should try to comply with that. Uh, my colleague Min will also be talking about it. Uh, on a parting note, I and in light of the prevailing COVID-19 situation, I and my team as always uh, advise the clients to first review the contracts, see if there is any force majeure language in them, and try to mitigate the clauses and reduce the effects of COVID-19 as much as they can. Thank you so much. This is all from my side. Thank you, Dilawar. Really appreciate it. Um, next, we've got Min Luong from our Los Angeles office. Min, if you could please discuss the risk assessment of contracts. Thank you, Jamin, and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, force majeure clauses are used in supply chain contracts. These are contracts between manufacturers, distributors, and providers of materials. In short, these contracts have multiple parties. Um, some example of these types of contracts are contracts for sale of goods, distribution agreements, reseller agreements and manufacturing agreements. Due to globalization, these types of contracts include parties throughout the entire world. And as we know, COVID-19 is a health pandemic that affects multiple countries. Some countries have been hit harder than others, but regardless, there is a serious um, disruption to the manufacturer's ability to produce products and fill orders on a timely basis. For example, factories and manufacturing facilities have been closed or reduced its capacity, especially in China. Um, airlines have suspended or reduced flights. Some ports are closed. All the while, there's been a, um, a huge increase in buying and um, a huge increase in buying panic. These obstacles have made it difficult for the performance of countless supply chain. For companies with outstanding supply chain obligation, it's important to review and evaluate potential avenues to protect the business. Um, this is important for both the seller of the product because there's a disruption and the impossibility to provide the product. And it's also important for the purchaser who wants to 
reject delivery of the order because it, it's late and they don't need it anymore. Um, these are some of the things that the supplier and the purchasers need to do to protect themselves. First, communication is key. Um, we need to communicate early and often. As Delaware noted, there is a notice requirement, and if you miss the notice requirement, you may not be able to use the force majeure clause. It may be litigated whether when the triggering event started and when the notice requirement time period ran out. Some people may argue that the triggering event was way back in March when the US president declared a national emergency, and at that time, companies should have given notice. Other people may argue that the triggering event was when the manufacturer had to close, and so therefore the product couldn't be delivered. To avoid this debate, companies should just communicate often. Um, also, companies need to document their actions. Um, keep documents of what the company took to fix, to replace, or to mitigate the breach. For example, a seller can inform the buyer that the manufacturer has been closed and they're looking to find a new supplier. This should be documented. You should also document how vendors are performing. Um, companies should monitor inventory. This way, when companies, this way the companies can prepare for new supplies and they can prepare for a shortage of supplies. Analyze possible delays even before it happens. So these supply chain contracts are generally covered under the Uniform Commercial Code, um, which governs the sales of goods. Businesses can find protection under the UCC for unforeseeable events beyond their control, such as COVID. It's so under the UCC, delay in delivery or non-delivery is not a breach of contract if the performance has been made impracticable. Those whose performance have been impaired must provide reasonable notice. Um, they need to alert the buyer of the delay or non-delivery. Again, that's why communication is so important. With that, I want to thank everyone and then pass it back to Jamin. Thanks, Min. Um, definitely agree with your point that uh, communication is key especially in these types of situations. Um, next, we've got Esther Q from our Reston office. Um, Esther, if you could please um, speak with us about uh, other types of uh, legal protection and some insurance options that uh, the attendees might have, please. Sure, thank you, Jamin. Um, hello, everyone. This is Esther Q. I'm attorney from Reston office. So other than the force majeure, I would like to introduce other types of legal protection. So um, I separate into two um, big group. The first is business insurance coverage, and the second topic is frustration of purpose. So as to the business insurance coverage, it's applicable to uh, different cases. So definitely you need to consider your own situation and the company and to pick a suitable uh, insurance coverage. So for example, the, the first insurance coverage is professional liability insurance. So this kind of insurance is for the cooperation or LLC uh, or any entity who do uh, the professional work such as dentist, the doctor, and also the law firm. So just protect this company and the, the individual from sued for malpractice, uh, which is the most uh, common cases. Um, the second part is the property insurance I think is pretty clear and self-explaining because uh, it's just a for cover the property which is damaged due to the unexpected events such as earthquake and fire so it will be a very common in our daily life um, the third one the workers compensation insurance I think it's very interesting and actually it's very important to different employers so workers' compensation insurance, it provides medical care, death, disability, and rehabilitation benefits for workers who are injured or killed while on a job. So you need to check the, the state law because most states require the employer to provide this uh, workers' compensation insurance uh, for their employee. So of course there are some exceptions, but most states require it. 
And however, we have to keep in mind that an employee can receive the benefits only if the injury relates to their job duties or employment. So which means uh, which doesn't you know which is not covered will be the intentional or if it's out of sight of the work or if there's some fault like a misbehavior. So for example, in a scenario, if you hire um, an employee and this employee has drunk issue and drug addiction. So when he did when he does the job, he fell from the roof and get injured. Uh, however, it will not be covered for this compensation because it's also on his fault as well. So however, a lot of my clients also ask about what about COVID-19? Can it be covered if my employees you know, um, catch the COVID-19 disease? So actually it's a really good and tricky question because it depends on how employee contract the disease. So we have to remember the normal exposure or contracture of the virus will not be considered to be a work related injury or condition. So the exposure must be a direct result of work. So for example, the doctor, the nurse who who get the disease or had this exposure um, directly due to the work. Um, the other thing is the work based business. Um, this work based or based business is specifically for the small business owner, especially the people who work at home and um, you know, attract the clients and do the business at home. So in that scenario, if clients uh, need to come to the house and to do the business, it will be covered. Um, the product liability insurance, I think is also very straightforward. It's just for the product and the liability raised um, due to the defects of product. Um, what we want to focus uh, is the last point on the business interruption insurance. So this insurance is very important because it's very attractive to a lot of clients. Uh, the business interruption insurance, uh, it replaces, it covers that replace income lost uh, in the event that the business is halted for some reason, um, such as fire or natural natural disaster uh, like earthquake. Um, so this type of insurance also covers operating expenses, a move to a temporary location, um, payroll, for example, taxes, a loan payment, rent or lease. But however, we need to keep in mind because it's a very important language in the policy. Um, it always the insurer will only pay for the actual loss of the business income and the customers sustained uh, due to the necessary suspension of the operation. So which means the insurance policy, uh, the insurance company will only be obligated to pay if the insured actually sustained an interruption of the business. So it's in well covered. Uh, for example, the cost of repairs, like what I said, living expenses and debris removal, um, cost for contractor or other specialist. However, it does not cover the short interruptions such as power outrage um, or scaled back operations. So it also will not um, protect the losses which is not related to the property insurance. So therefore, I will answer the question. It will not cover um, loss of profits due to the COVID-19 um, because most of the insurance company doesn't cover this kind of um, breach of contract or loss because it will be viewed as a business risk. So um, the last part I'm going to I'll uh, hand over to the, my colleague Vivek because uh, he will give more details about what is frustration of purpose. But here I just would like to give a very brief um, uh, scenario to explain what is frustration of purpose. So basically it was uh, it is a valid defense, a defense for the breach of contract uh, when unexpected event happens and destroyed the whole principle of the contract. So the very easy sample will be if you hire somebody to paint your roof. Um, however, the house is damaged due to a fire. Uh, definitely there is no roof to be painted. So this also damaged the whole purpose of this contract. Uh, therefore, in this scenario, it's 100 applicable to the scenario to use a valid defense as frustration of purpose. So I think that's my part. Thank you so much, Jamin. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Esther. Um, it was a very uh, good presentation on, on that uh, business insurance coverage. 
Um, and as you mentioned, um, Vivek Goyle from our also from our rest and office is next. Um, if you could talk to us about uh, how to break a commercial lease. Thank you, Jamin. Hello, everyone. This is Vivek Nanesh Goyal. I'll be discussing breaking of commercial lease due to unforeseen event like COVID-19 pandemic today. As we all know, pandemic continues to spread there. There is a growing anxiety among landlords and tenants as they assess the, the ability of tenants to maintain normal business operations. As various cities and state holds restrictions on the size of public gathering and even the type of business that can uh, permit to operate for more than three months now. Such concerns and uncertainty has only increased with the time. Therefore, it has been difficult, costly or even impossible for some businesses to maintain contractual obligations like commercial lease due to pandemic. Luckily for business owners, the doctrine of force majeure and commercial frustration may also allow them to rescind lease without penalties if unforeseeable circumstances make it impossible for them to operate under stated purpose of their lease. I'll be discussing four measure now, force measure now. With force measure clause in contract, business have option to escape their commercial lease due to unforeseen event beyond their control, such as public health events like the COVID-19 pandemic. To break commercial lease, or other contractual uh, using force measure contract. They must have the clause in the common language with faces like act of God, disaster, catastrophe, etc. And the affected parties must show that it is impossible for them to perform the contract during pandemic. They must also prove that the business is facing difficulties, hardship or commercial impractability because the pandemic which were unforeseeable outside their control and could not have been prevented. What if we don't have force majeure clause in contract? Most US states recognize common law doctrines such as frustration and impossibility, which may be invoked to excuse contract performance under certain circumstances. Both parties choosing to invoke these common laws doctrine often face significant hurdles. For example, New York limits the doctrine of impossibility to case where first performance is objectively impossible due to destruction of means of performance by an act of God, force majeure event or subsequent passage of law rendering performance illegally. Or second, there has been a change in circumstances so fundamental that it would be unjust or contrary to public policies to hold the parties to their original agreement. Generally speaking, impossibility could include, for example, the death or incapacity of the persons necessary to perform or the destruction of an irre irrecoverable goods or component. Impossibility generally would be included event like destruction to commutable inventory or inconvenience. Now I'll be discussing commercial frustration or frustration of purpose. As other panelists already discussed, commercial frustration doctrine applies generally to the unforeseen circumstances that makes a party contract performance virtually impossible. Doctrine has commonly used to nullify the contracts during the wartime. Because past US government wartime restrictions mirror the, those of the present day, commercial frustration applies during the coronavirus pandemic as well. However, a party can use the doctrine of commercial frustration depends on the specific terms of the contract. Most leases contain a statement of purpose. If not, a purpose may still be implied by the circumstances. Here, both parties must have mutual understanding of the purpose. Courts only hold commercial frustration if the purpose or desire object of parties have been frustrated, like lease restriction prop properties to specific purpose of the business cannot perform because of government order. Then it is possible to terminate the lease by using commercial frustration. For example, 
a tenant of with a lease stating that property shall be used only for a crossfit gym and all gym in town have been ordered to remain closed has a greater chance of successfully applying the doctrine of commercial frustration during the pandemic that's all from my end today thank you everyone for your time over to you jamin thank you vivek um, and, and then back over to Min from our LA office. Um, if you don't mind uh, talking about just uh, some other general steps that businesses can take to protect themselves right now, please. Thank you, Jamin. Um, there are ways to help businesses. Using the force majeure clause is just one of the ways. I want to recap, um, not all force majeure clauses are created equal. Parties entering into contracts should negotiate the terms of their contract. This includes including the terms or negotiating the terms of the force majeure clause. And it's really important that we think about COVID while we draft and negotiate the terms of new contracts moving forward. Um, I want to tell you guys about one of my clients who has a commercial lease with a force majeure clause. Um, I'm pretty sure no one paid any attention to it before COVID, but now with COVID, everyone is paying attention to the force majeure clause. The clause stated that in the event of a natural disaster or force majeure, the landlord and or the tenant shall be excused for the delay in the performance of their obligation, except their obligation to pay any sum of rent. Now, if we represent the landlord, sure, we'll try to put that provision in. But if we represent the tenant, there's no way that's going to go inside the contract. Um, so it is really important to consider the terms of the contract when you enter into a contract. These are things that parties should consider and should try to negotiate. Um, for supply chain, if another business in the supply chain can't perform, what will happen to the next person who can't perform? Will they be excused? Um, what are the parameters for relief? Is it rent delay, rent forgiveness, or simple termination of contract? What are the notice requirements? Should the party who wants relief inform the other party right away, uh, within three days, as soon as possible? Um, and then we should negotiate and discuss how can we terminate the contract and put these terms inside the contract. Additional steps businesses can do to help move forward. Um, I would look at local ordinance and state laws. For example, in California, Governor Newsom signed an order which prohibit landlord from evicting tenant for non-payment of rent and prohibit enforcement of eviction by law enforcement until at least July 28th. Now this date may get extended and it has been extended a couple of times. Many cities within California have expanded the order. Um, the order increased the time for tenant to respond for any, if there is a UDA case, an unlawful detainer case, from five days to 60 days. There is uh, documentation requirements. The tenant has to provide document of loss of income due to COVID. Um, I, I tell all my clients they're not in they're not in this alone. Everyone is going through the same thing that they are. Um, so the government have been giving a lot of government aid and packages and businesses should look at these government aids. Um, in Orange County, the supervisor Andrew Doe is providing 13 million to small businesses in several cities. He's giving um, $10,000 grant to each businesses based on a lottery system. And this money is free and you don't have to return it. Um, it can be used for rent, for insurance, for account payable, to purchase uh, personal protection equipment to help the business open during COVID. Um, and as Jamin explained earlier, there are SBA loans and the payroll protection plan, and that can be used to pay um, payroll and rent and businesses should look into these SBA loans. Um, businesses should talk to their tax advisor to explore tax credit. Companies are paying their employees um, emergency paid sick leave. They'll get a tax credit 
for for the time that they paid their employees for the, being on leave. Lastly, um, because America believes in second chances, there is the option for filing for bankruptcy. Definitely, definitely talk to your attorney before you do this. There are different chapters and depending on your situation, um, you can follow chapter seven, chapter 11, chapter 13. Um, definitely talk to your attorney before restructuring the business. And you need to look to see if there's a personal guarantee. Do you have to file um, personal bankruptcy or will it just be the corporation that signed the contract and will the corporation restructure? Um, that's all on my side. Back to you, Jamin. Thank you, Min. Um, I, uh, similar to your client that you mentioned, I had one uh, exactly like that last week as well, where the force majeure clause stated that um, the tenant is excused from everything except for paying rent during a, an act of God uh, or force majeure event. And so certainly um, helpful for the landlord, but not so much for the tenant. Um, but OK, um, so we'll open it up. Thank you all of the, uh, the panelists for for the, the insight and the information. Um, we'll open it up uh, to our attendees for Q&A. And there's one that that came through just a, a moment ago, and so I'll read it out. In a software consulting business, if a client has ended a contract during COVID-19, is it OK to terminate your employee working on that contract? And how does the PPP, um, how is it uh, applied here? Um, so Min, you mentioned that um, in, in your closing remarks. If you don't mind um, taking this question, please. Yes, thank you, Jamin. So generally, employment is employment at will. So you can definitely terminate employment if there isn't job. Um, that's a lot of companies are doing that. There's no problem with that, as long as you're not doing it for um, a discriminatory reason. Um, and as far as the payroll PPP, um, the government has reduced the criteria for forgiveness. It used to be 75% has to be used toward payroll, but now it's 60%. So there's a bunch of criteria for it to be forgiven, but just one person losing their job, um, I think it will be okay. Uh, yeah, they, they just reduced it down from um, 75 to 60 uh, recently, and uh, not everyone's happy with that, but certainly that's what it is now, the threshold for uh, the PPP forgiveness. So. Um, you know, if you have any specific, if the the attendee has any specific questions, definitely reach out to us. I'm happy to help you with that. Um, Sasha, um, any other questions that from, from any of the attendees that want to ask live? The um, the insurance portion um, that uh, Esther was discussing, um, I feel like we've received a lot of questions about that in the last little while. Um, Esther, do you mind um, just uh, uh, mentioning a, a little bit more about the business interruption um, and how, um, in your experience with, with the clients that, that have reached out to you, um, kind of what have you um, advised them as to um, making a claim for business interruption or anything else uh, in terms of um, how to protect themselves at, at this time? Sure, thank you, Jamin. Um, of course, uh, so the first, uh, when the clients comes to us asking about whether they can um, use this uh, business interruption insurance uh, to cover any lost income. So the first thing we always ask is, uh, have you ever read this policy? Because actually for the business interruption insurance policy, it should have very specific language about what is covered or what is not. So uh, absolutely, the COVID-19 is a very unfortunate situation for the every 
you know, business owner and they're trying to use this kind of defense like or they trying to see whether the business interruption insurance can cover um, the any uh, lost income or whatever. So I always would like to say because it must be the actual loss. So and also it must be related to the, the property. So for example, if um, the house gets fired or because of the earthquake on something um, from natural out of control, um, then for example, there is um, out of um, you know, they cannot continue working in the office. Uh, they have to relocate. Uh, this is definitely the actual loss what, what we are thinking about. But if it's just a for um, the loss of money or just a simple income, then most of the insurance will not cover that part um, because it's just a very normal business risk. I know it's, you know, I hate to say that, but uh, it's a normal thing. Um, as to the workers' compensation insurance, uh, well, as what I discussed previously, um, also a lot of clients ask whether um, it can be covered um, because of this COVID-19 and what they should do um, to protect their employee and whether it can be covered. So it's also, as I mentioned, um, it must be directly out of um, the course of business. So if you just a normal uh, commute and they just drive your car on the way, you get it. Um, unfortunately, it's not covered as well uh, in under the workers compensation insurance. So it also always case by case and uh, the first thing is always recommend our clients to go back to check the policy. Um, that's the most important part. Thank you, Jamin. I, I just wanted to add, if, if I can, this is sure, Nancy. Right, please. Thank you. Um, for business interruption loss, there has to be some physical alteration to the property um, for for the insurance to cover it generally. And because of COVID and the government shutdown, there necess there may not necessarily be any physical damage to the property. Now, some lawyers are getting very creative and they're arguing. Well, um, I have employees who got sick, tested positive for COVID, and they touched the property. And now the property may or may not have some virus. And so the physical um, property has been altered. So now is it possible for me to get business interruption loss? And this has never happened before. Everything is really new. So the answer is kind of unclear right now. Um, I would still recommend filing a claim. Let's see if legislature determine or make some new changes. But technically, um, and especially for a lot of businesses who don't even have anybody tested positive, there is no damage to the property. So it, it is more difficult to get business interruption loss. Yeah, that, that's a creative argument, though, from the from the um, uh, from from the company saying that uh, if if an employee touched something, then it's no longer usable and it causes damage. That's that's actually a uh, an interesting way to go about it. But um, uh, I've seen the saying that uh, it's physical damage. That's been the uh, the essence of the the policy in the past, and so that's what um, that's kind of what they the insurance companies are abiding by currently as well. Um, I want to make a quick note about the um, I mentioned early on about the unemployment insurance. And so um, to, to the attendee that had the question about, um, you know, terminating the employee, uh, if they're eligible, certainly depending on their um, you know, immigration status and, and whatnot, um, they the employee that's terminated uh, could be eligible for state benefits and the six hundred dollars uh, per week. Uh, federal benefit that is scheduled to run out on uh, July the 31st. Um, we'll know closer to the end of the month or mid to the end of the month whether that's extended or not. But um, the um, the the current uh, as of a couple of days ago, at least the U.S. unemployment rate sat at about 13 percent. Um, and so we'll have to see what the administration um, decides uh, or, or what Congress decides on that um, and if the administration signs off on it. Um, 
any other um, questions? Um, oh, here, here's a question here. Vivek spoke about coming out of a commercial lease. Can a business come out of a lease without paying a penalty? Um, Vivek, do you want to take this question? Um, it, it's here on the um, it, yeah, yeah. up here. If you'd like to take it, please. Yeah, as discussed, uh, yes, the business can uh, come out of the lease without paying penalty. If the purpose of the lease is uh, specifically uh, frustrated. And if there is a uh, force majeure clause in a lease and you satisfy that uh, there is an unforeseenable circumstances and that you cannot avoid and uh, there's an act of God disaster orchestra fee. So yes, the uh, business can avoid penalties while breaking the lease. And I, I this Vikram, uh, I, I'll, and I'll also add to that as well. Uh, I actually recently worked on a case where I had a client who was trying to break out of a lease agreement uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic. And um, that's the one challenge is it's, uh, you know, we eventually had to negotiate some form of buyout so that if you want to call that a penalty, you can. But usually the landlord, uh, they at least from what my experience so far, they won't just accept that. Yeah, you have, you know, because. Um, you know, it in a lot of circumstances, you know, your your purpose may not be necessarily frustrated by the pandemic. I mean, if you're uh, a business in uh, the stock market. I actually that was the case of well, I had my client was in the equity stock market business, so the, it was really hard to argue that the pandemic had an impact on their business. So that's one thing you know you just want to warm it, warn everyone out there about is that it's not like an easy get out of jail card like in that game Monopoly. Yeah, absolutely, Vikram. Um, uh, I agree with uh, with exactly what you said there. Um, and uh, we haven't mentioned yet, but there there's been a moratorium on um, evictions uh, for residential leases, at least for residential tenants um, throughout the country. Uh, it's jurisdiction specific, but um, it's been going on for for quite some time. Um, and uh, there's kind of a default moratorium because the courts are still closed, so. I've had a, a client uh, who owns a, a few commercial plazas and they've been trying to evict a, a tenant. It was um, uh, probably at the first week of March um, after they stopped paying rent um, and we haven't been able to um, get them out because the courts have been closed. So, um, you know, certainly that's been an issue um, throughout the country with, uh, with certain litigation cases uh, being on hold. I know I've done um, several Zoom hearings and, um, and other cases have just been put on hold until um, uh, until the ban is, uh, is kind of lifted there. So um, uh, if there are no other questions, um, you know, we can go ahead and end the presentation. I will um, echo the sentiments of what uh, Min said earlier about we're all in this together and we're kind of all going through this together. Um, uh, not just throughout the United States, but uh, throughout the globe. And so uh, I hope that uh, you all stay safe and healthy. And if there's anything that uh, we could ever do for you, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And thank you to all the, uh, the uh, attendees for um, your time today and to Vikram, Delauer, Min, Esther, Vivek, uh, Sasha, Francesca, and Deepa for, for all your hard work today.